But at a point, I know it's Hollywood or what, I don't know. But the principle behind that is this is how serious heinous our sins, human sins, is. It's so bad. You kill me, I kill you. You blow me up, I blow you up, and just send missile back and forth. Press a button automatically, just send to wherever we computerize and them um, and the, all the whole earth crumble. Let's say some survive in some bunker or something, whatnot, you know? The radiation will kill you off at the end of the war. I don't know if you remember the Japanese uh, uh, nuclear plant, number two, fell, collapsed. It went to the ocean, thank God. However, it seeped through the water and affect every pop, every one, single one of us in a whole globe population, both men and women, child and adult. All of us affected by that, even in America, now. As if you gone through some x-ray five times already. And people say a lot of people die from cancer, this, that, all of that. Part of it, not all of it. And the Japanese, obviously, affected by radiation five times more than cotton, like in America. But it traveled through water and seep up and blow up in an atmosphere everywhere. That's what happened with the little small collapse of nuclear plant. And this is a thousand million times more than that because it's going to full explosive sending back and forth. And remember, we live in a closed atmosphere called the globe, and we cannot escape that. We come out from that, after everything dies, not gonna make it. If we make it, we might grow more fingers and nose and you know crazy thing, or losing this and that and you know Star War type of thing. Sad to say, but it's coming. The fact that it's coming, God used it. That or God directly sent His judgment to Earth. Which it is or use human bomb will happen. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of time. So sin and evil are is the reality of, of of sin and evil is so clear to all of us. And all of that will not go unpunished. That is why Paul expressed in this simple four verses that I'm talking about, his thankfulness that God judge him faithful and then appointing him to his service. And then he clearly, we talk about this and next week we will explain more, the mystery of being judged by God as a sinner, which he give thanks to God, and then turn around to be faithful. And then more than judged by God to be faithful, not condemned, but faithful and appointing to be someone God would call his own ambassador. And that's why he burst in 2, 13 and 14, the mercy and the grace of God and the faith and love from Jesus Christ pour upon him. And 17, yes, we remember last week, he burst out in doxology, in which we study more in the nature, characters, and attributes and essence of God. And that was we left off last week. But today, let's go through the, the context of that three, four verses in the whole chapter. And we move forward toward communion, and we'll come back to study more about 
um, first Timothy chapter one later. But today I'm just going to run through real quick, give you the the outline and which gives us the context to why Paul said this. And then we, again, I mentioned earlier, we'll come back later next week. If you study this on your own, with my help, my outline or not, it's up to you, or just read through or just absorb the scripture into your soul, it will be much blessing to you, to you. It's not a small thing. You study this. Anyway, this is an outline, simple outline. Again, this is not a great detail, but it's helpful outline. I break down to five portion, five parts, section, I mean, five section in this first chapter. First section, Verse 1 and 2 is proper greetings. Section number 2, 3 to 11, the main point of his letter, of his introduction, of his chapter 1. And then 12 to 16, he injects his personal experience, gratitude, with the topic of what he mentioned called the sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. 12 to 16. And portion number four, one verse only, verse 17, which result in doxology. And that alone loaded with heavy, heavy, strong doctrine needed. And then verse 18 to 20, the last part of uh, my outline here, it's <coughs> reminding us again how serious sound doctrine about sin, about hell, about right doctrine needed in the church and the ramification, the result of sound doctrine and of false doctrine to his beloved son, Timothy, the son in the faith, and also a pastor. Those are five portion, portion five part section of this first chapter of First Timothy. Okay, let me run through real quick. Earlier I just give you the outline. Now a little bit of detail, and then we move forward. One through two, like I said, said that proper greeting. He greet, you know, Greek culture. In that ancient time, you write a letter to someone. You say, I am so-and-so, you know, um, write to you. In our modern world, you write to the person, you write, dear so-and-so. And at the end, you tell them who you are, you know? In this culture, you write who you are first, and then you write to so-and-so. He said, he, uh, said himself, Paul, I'm Paul. And then he stated his <coughs> position, an apostle. An apostle, it's not a small thing, not a small position. An apostle of God, of Jesus Christ. And then immediately <coughs> in this greeting, we have a very, very serious, proper theology right, right on from the start. He said that I'm apostle by the command of God. God ordained direct command. This is immediately, he expressed the sovereignty of God. But not so much of who he was yet, but still, this is all God. And then he expressed who God is. Remember, he's a Jewish Pharisee scholar. God is his savior now. A lot of times we hear Jesus Christ is savior, but now God is our savior and Jesus Christ our hope. Express his apostleship by the command of God and Jesus. The hope and the Savior. 
And then he wrote to Timothy, addressed Timothy, his true child in the faith. True child in the faith. And then again, to seal it, who he is, apostle, who Timothy is, a pastor in that church, Ephesus church, and a child in the faith, talk about the faith and the apostleship and the service to God, is by the grace and mercy from God and peace. Immediately, he expressed the doctrine of grace and mercy from God and peace from God. And God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, Christianity cannot split God being our Father, God being our hope, God being our Savior, and especially God being our Lord, our Master. You cannot call yourself a Christian, have no connection to God as a Master who leads your life, who commands, who order, who direct you. Cannot. It's not a pick and choose. It's not a fair weather religion. Although it's a lot of blessing, a lot of grace, a lot of mercy, a lot of hope, a lot of peace, and all of that, and privilege to serve. However, clear structure here. You're not a free reign lancer, a freelancer, and you do whatever you want here. However, a person like Paul who was up in the top and then understand all of this, how much more for you and I, who nobody, we are nobody, absolutely, you know that. We cannot barely make it through a basic task. Some can do more than another, but failure is a huge lot in front of us. So because of that, we understand what it means to receive grace, mercy, and peace from God. And because of that, we know that we are no boss, no captain of our own ship. We have our own captain. We have our own lord, our own master. We are nobody free here. Though we're free from sin, from hell, we are free men, politically, not really. But we are free from sin and all of that under the condition we belong to a master. A good and righteous, benevolent master. A lord and king. That verse 1 and 2 clearly express and teach that doctrine on a spot. For Christian, you understand more than understand, you absorb and you accept and you apply right away. Because in an immediate effect by the power and the grace and mercy and, and divine power to choose you to be this way. You don't grow slowly to get, receive the grace. You grow slowly to receive mercy, slowly to receive peace from God. No, it's not. Slowly to become God's servant. Or Jesus slowly become your Lord. No, immediately you are. You, did, you are, you ain't. Somebody said that. So, Paul addressed from the leader in the sense from the top to the bottom, from the apostle to the pastor, and this will apply to all of us. And 3 to 11, we talk about main point, main doctrine, sound doctrine. Be careful, be careful. Sound doctrine is important. You must teach everything clear, direct, and correct, and power, with power, with passion. When Paul talked about the sovereignty of God, when the Bible talked about sovereignty of God, the grace of God, the love of God, and the sin is clearly displayed and explained. There's no confusion in there. We may, may not reconcile all this point in our mind, but it's clearly teached. Top. And especially the concept of sin, you and I cannot ignore, regardless how we feel about it. And interestingly, you notice that even atheists, 
atheist. I mentioned it earlier. Do not deny the concept, the fact that it's evil in the world. They may explain it away, they may excuse it away, someone worse or some evil worse than another. That's fine. They spiral down to something worse than themselves to excuse themselves. But the fact is, one, sin exists. Evil exists, of course. Two, whether it has a different degree, why well, I never kill anybody, isn't that? Okay. But still, does it exist? Yes. Do you have some? Yeah, they won't expect that. Well, one sin and ten sin uh, result in death the same. They would not accept that until you trying to reason with them, you know, one stone through the glass window and ten stone to glass window, which one really break the window? You know, you know that. All that. Intellectually, logically, intelligently, they agree, but I'm glad they at least agree that much. That is why it's important that we, Christian, must stand on a sound doctrine. Do not, let, uh, do not let those people, we cannot let those people to seep into the church and try to preach and teach. In the Christian realm, church, something else, to lighten the load of sin. We cannot do that. Sin is sin. Narcissism, since first century until now, and we have so many nuance to explain sin away. But bottom line, it just, oh well, yeah, I know the sin, but uh, uh, it's a different degree and so on. They don't believe in God, but they believe in the ugliness and sinfulness of mankind, so on. <coughs> Reality, we all affect by that. Reality, we're all one family in this globe. Reality, we are human beings, relate to one another. And reality, we do think sin. For sure, they may or may not commit crime as the worst criminal in the society or in another nation or country. But do we think sinful thing, evil thing? We qualify for it already. Do we say sinful things, evil things? Yes. And then, thirdly, do we act? Yes. Some may not act as the other, but do we act enough? Some may not act at all, but do we say enough? Yes. Some may not even say a thing. They try not to, or whatever, or their nature, but do they think sin? Yes. So sound doctrine is very important. And then verse three and four talk about sound different doctrine. And remember we are the stewardship from God that is by faith, talk about faith, and talk about our aim. The aim of our, my charge, our charge is love that issue from a pure heart. We must, there's no, no true Christianity doctrine just because intellectual correct theology that has no pure heart, no love that come from pure heart and good conscience and sincere faith. That is heavy, heavy loaded. So difference in re re theologies and denominations and so on, but one thing you need to look for the correct doctrine, more than just, oh, I, I have the correct doctrine because I have all this fact about the Trinity, about this, about this, about that, or I have the PhD and this and that. That's great, but does it have, based on love, that is godly love, that come from pure heart. Love that come from pure heart. Easily to have love, but not pure heart. Good conscience. That set aside what good doctrine is. Even if you have good conscience, pure heart, you have no love. That's bad. 
if when you have love, maybe pure heart, but your conscience is not clear. It's bad. Ultimately, verse 5 is loaded with a sincere faith. Sincere faith. You know, if you deal with people, I'm not talking about doctrine anymore, I'm talking about people, a person, or people, or ourselves, have this element, maybe little, little, at least something, small percentage in growth, and this, that is what I call true hope. True hope in faith and salvation. Otherwise, it's hard to deal with those people without love, pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. Do you love people in general, even sinners? Do you love yeah, your family, obviously? Do you love those who love God, not your blood? Your pure heart or your wicked heart, you have trick in your heart. You have good conscience, you're clear about your conscience. Is your faith sincere? Very heavy. And sound doctrine, the end of verse 10, is a must. Anything contrary, contradict sound doctrine, be careful. And all of this, the sound doctrine must go according with the gospel. You want to test what is sound doctrine? Does it go with the gospel? I'm not talking about minor things, less significant, significant point. I'm talking about major, major doctrine. You know, people can argue about baptize this and that, about this and that. Uh, that's not too important. It's important, but it's not too important. The main thing is the gospel. That Christ came from heaven, took form as a person, lived a holy life as a human being, and sacrificed his life, died on a cross, buried, raised from the dead, and went back to heaven. Give us, pay our price and release us from the bondage of sin. And then eventually, until we meet him, we serve him. And then he come and pick us up. That the gospel, sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel. And that's what we are in trust. That is why Paul Take a little break from 12 to 16 here to inject his personal feeling based on his understanding theologically, logically, and personally. He expressed his gratitude to what God have given him. Again, God judge him and you know Paul, you know the doctrine of Paul, he's not dealing with sin lightly. However, interesting point here, I mentioned all along, which we'll go next week to detail more, that God judged him. Understand Paul's term, judge God holy, hate sin, and so on. However, this interesting point here, God judged him, faith. Faith, uh, faithful, not faithful, God judge him faithful, count him faithful, and then appoint him to do his service. One must wonder and where and when God judge him faithful and appoint him. When is that Paul is so faithful to God? While well, Paul is an apostle, he served God, he died for God, and so on. Maybe so, maybe so. 
not disagree with that, but judge him and appoint him. When did God judge him? When did God appoint him? When did God do all of that? That is a very powerful, heavy doctrine, an exciting doctrine and message I've been preparing to preach. It applies not only to Paul or Timothy, it applies to all of us. God is a righteous judge. He doesn't take bribe. He doesn't ignore his own, he doesn't violate his own law. Sin must be punished. And you know, oh yeah, the cross and so on. Yes, you're right. But the depth in it, the mysterious depth and the treasure in it, God judge him faithful. When is Paul said to be faithful for God? And then appointing him, he said, because he's faithful, that's why God appoint him later. No, God appoint him right away. Remember that in the book of Acts. Paul was extremely serious about attacking God, you know, attacking Christ. Right? You remember that? On the dot, he stopped on his track, and then he said, Lord, Lord, who are you? And Christ said, get up. I send you to do, appoint you to do. I send you, I mean appoint you to do my work, to be my ambassador. That one same spot right there on top of each other. That's amazing. That's something that I am passionately still studying, enjoy, and can't wait to preach on that topic. But we know we go forward at this point at least. He thanked God for that. He thanked God for the mercy on verse 13 and grace and the faith and the love that God given to him, appoint him, judge him. And then he opened up a little bit on verse 15. Verse 13, he ignored, not ignore. Yeah, I'm sorry. He um, admit that he was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent to God, clearly. Though he said he act ignorantly, but still wrong, still in unbelief. Not as a why I didn't know as ignorant, I act in unbelief. Not an excuse. He talked about the state of ignorance, state of unbelief, state of sin, and being supposed to be judged and damned to hell. That's what he meant by that. Otherwise, the word grace and mercy would not apply here. A lot of times people say, see, see, he excused, he said he acted in ignorance. He didn't know. Oh, too bad. I don't know. And you ask somebody something, what you do? I don't know. They can't even say straight, I don't know. I don't know. That you know, they really excuse. And from now on, say, I don't know. Oh, wow, so arrogant to say, I don't know. Well, either way, you're wrong. Paul said that I did not know. I was unbelief. I was a sinner. He said this in a sense that he's wrong. But he received mercy and grace and love and faith instead. Overflow that are in Christ Jesus. Because he came to the world to save sinners, whom I was a former. I received mercy and so on. That is why 17, to the king, to the king, and you know, doxology we studied last week. And now 18 to 20, he talked about, I charge you, hold on to this doctrine, which the good warfare fight, holding up the faith with good conscience. And then the consequent, the ramification of this wrong doctrine or opposing the right doctrine and opposing God ultimately. For example, like this two individual written in the Holy Scripture for the rest of the humanity to read, Hermeneus, Alexander, whom I have handed it over to Satan. That's not a smart thing. 
Oh, why well, I'm going to discipline put him in the corner? No. Paul didn't believe, God didn't believe in uh, send somebody lightly uh, put in the corner. Send him out to Satan. Get a big, big spank. Oh, you ask me, do I believe in Spain? I don't know. That's God. So Satan can be the teacher or the controller or the master, whatever. Hand them, them over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme God. I don't equate everybody, disagree, a uh, little thing. At home, as a child, you're supposed to do this, wash your hand, and then you send them out to Satan. I don't mean that. But the principle is when people reach to the limit of no return, blasphemy, then this to God and the spirit of, of violating, disrespectful, unteachable, you don't teach them anymore. You teach them separately, differently from you were to teach and build. You teach in a different way. And scary to say, scary, scary to say, you send them to a different teacher now, no longer teaching in a church, in a loving environment, in a correcting environment, this correcting in a correct facility under the power of Satan himself. That's clear. But anyway, we will go back there again. Okay. The whole tone is, this is a very serious doctrine here. The serious doctrine here, Paul, both doctrine and, and, and commanding and sending out um, explanation, the result, consequence, is about examination oneself and the consequence judgment. As much as he talked about God judge him faithful, he didn't say, okay, then take it easy. No, he talked about careful with judgment, careful with doctrine, careful with examination. Examine, examine, watch out you teach, watch out your life, watch out this, watch out that. Judgment is a big thing. Verse 12, we misread it all the time. He judged me faithful in appointing me to his service. Carefully study that. Again, I'm saying again and again, the moment God judge him and the moment God appoint him, where is the part that he's faithful to be, to deserve not to be punished and to deserve the position as an apostle? Is that a gap? Is that a, 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 a long gap? Is a silent moment? And later on, he's talk about in general, talk about general, he's sinful, general, he appointed. Could be, but... Something else deeper than that, which highlight the mercy, the grace, the act of God, the sovereignty of God against sin, against sin. There's no, no gap, airtight, airtight. And there's no way anything escaped in the sight of God, in the doctrine of Paul, in the doctrine of Christianity. That's how serious, how amazing, how cool it is, I would say. Paul continue in the whole Pauline doctrine, epistle, or teaching, based on examine oneself. Examine oneself. For example, do communion. Doing communion. He said, before you take communion, and this is I'm saying to you as well, every first week of the month, and every day, every time I talk about this, especially for the serious somber special moment to remember the Son of God who died for sinner. Especially you call yourself a Christian. Especially you call yourself he is your savior. Personally, nobody pushes you to do volunteer free will in a human sense to follow Jesus, to become Christian. Nobody forced you. I'm talking about this in this group, this individual. Other different story. So, for those, for those of us who commit ourselves to follow Jesus, become Christian, and commit ourselves to take communion every time, every month. I've seen this all the time, all the time. Sad to say, right in front of our face. And not to say I am spiritually 
um, powerful anything have uh, the, the apostle I God I said but a lot of times it's obvious that people take communion but betray God on the spot all the time sad sad to say and sad for two reasons one sad that they do this who are God they take it lightly his death his sacrifice on the cross is, you know just think about a person who died whether he is savior or not for the the sense of helping saving uh, intent to save us and we make a joke out of it oh you know i i cannot i i, I don't understand how people are so wicked to do that let alone sincerely believe we go to heaven because of him who died on the cross for and still take a joke make a joke out of it I see that all the time. Betrayer, betrayer, betrayer since Judas is scared until our day. And therefore, I remind you, Paul said this, examine, examine, a soul. Clearly examine of soul. Clearly, clearly. Do not take the judgment of God. Examine it. Exam, examine ourselves lightly. Because you see that the passage of a communion passage, you know that God still judge even his own children, his, even people in the church, especially judge, examine ourselves. And 31, 32, the same chapter 11 of First Corinthians, we judge ourselves truly because we can see clearly the con condemnation to the world is coming. We don't want to be a part of it. Very important. And not only, <clears throat> not only for the communion in general, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we must examine ourselves to see if we are seriously in the faith. Are we in the faith? Are we seriously a believer? Paul does that even though God judged him faithfully appointed. He see himself. If you want to ask Paul, Paul, what do you think about yourself? This is Apostle Paul. In Romans chapter 7, 18 to 24, he see himself as nothing. Wretched man, ugly man, nothing good in him. He count himself the body of death body of stench or death, evil, disease, and death. What he, how he view himself, that. How he view himself in the aspect of apostle. Among the apostle, he saw himself the least of the apostle. Three points here I want to draw, conclusion here. With the apostle, you see, he saw himself as a least, least of apostle. He doesn't bring himself up, although he very awesome, as you know, that we don't have time to talk about. And now, from seeing himself as a least of apostle, he sees himself as the least of the, all the Christian. Now, below apostle, he's a leader, he's a least. Now he saw himself even lower to the second group. Just Christian alone, not apostle, not servant of God specially appointed. Just Christian alone, he saw himself as a least, not only a least of least of all Christian. And that's number two. Number three, he saw himself deeper as he grow in the faith, as he preach, as he teach, as he wrote the Bible, as he taught people like the Timothy to teach other. He saw himself the worst of all sinner. See? The least of apostle, the least of all Christians, now the least and the worst of all sinners. Third level is cannot go lower than that. That was and um this is a vision, he's the least of the saint of all Christians, and the next one, first Timothy 115. He's the foremost of all sinners. That's why when he bursts out and say, Thank God for giving me the strength. Because you judge me, that gap there, judge me, we understand, and faithful, judge me, and faithful, wow, that's a big, solid, solid, heavy doctrine here. 
and now worse, more than that, appointing me. Judge me one thing, and call me faithful or nothing, and appointing me another thing bigger. And that next week, we're out of time today. However, because of our communion, and also the answers in there as well, a little bit of a uh, um, horizon of what we're going to see in full light, that though he, Paul, supposed to be judged by God, condemned to hell, now as a believer, now as an apostle, he received the information when Jesus taught in the very special moment called the Last Supper, the Communion. This is a very important doctrine, Paul said, in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 32. He said that this I receive from the Lord, which I give to you. Important, do this. And then he noted, he mentioned betrayer, sin, to the most ultimate ugliness of sin, the night that Jesus was betrayed. And that Paul can just, I feel, a sense not only to this betray Jesus and this, he felt the ugliness of betrayal and sin in him to God, to Jesus. He responsible for all of that. However, verse 24, right away, Jesus demonstrate, taught and demonstrate and command at the same time his sacrificial act on a cross. Talking about offering his life his body to die by using the bread of the given thing, broke it, this is the symbol of his life, and said, this is my body broken for you, which is for you, the, the word here, which is for you, right there, cover and unearth, when Paul said, God judge me faithful, Fall on that three simple words, which is for you. I know, three. Three! Which is for you. Mm -hmm. no. The body of Christ is broken, which is for you. Did God judge Paul correctly? Condemn Paul? Yes. Jesus Christ was broken, was sacrificed, offered to God for you, Paul, and all of us. You see that? You see the glimpse. Now do this to remember me in remembrance of me. And then again, the same way he took the cup after supper, saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood, the same thing, I die for you, and I promise you, it is a new covenant, agreement, legal, that you are saved. You're mine, for you, for you. And what I'm asked of you is, what I ask of you is to do this, to remember me, to worship me, to remember, not to remember cognitively, memory, but to worship me, to have a relationship with me. And, of course, to go, in verse 26, to preach the gospel, to preach, proclaim the Lord's death, the Lord's death until he returned. That means he come back. And then he saw 27 on, he talked about examine, examine yourself, examine yourself, and judge yourself, and do not judge yourself truly, do not let this pass by without repenting, without acknowledge, without knowing, without repenting, without remorsing, without bleeding in your heart how much you, your nature, your thought, your word, your action, past, present, and future, have caused the Lord to die for you. Otherwise, it's an ongoing thing. You said, I thought I'm saved. Yes, being saved, that's why you do that. Not to do that, to, be, to get saved. <clears throat> no, being saved, that's why you do that. How would you love and appreciate someone who did a great big thing for you and you did it once and say, yeah, I'm done it. I done that already over, so forget it. No, it's not the nature of someone who's like this. 
otherwise we will be condemned along the world. The judgment shall fall any time. Already happened. As for you and me, we have this opportunity to go by the grace and mercy and faith and love because that's what Christ did for us. Remember that. Remember that. Remember all of this. Especially remember the person who did this for us and given us all the freedom from being condemned, not condemned, and then receive salvation, and then receive the privilege to serve, to proclaim the Lord's death, to proclaim the gospel until the end, which is God return. This is a quick, very quick message on all of that, including the, 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 the communion. And I did not try to fit it in so we have communion also. No, it's, it's there already on its own. I am blessed to share this. I'm excited, I'm very happy to share this, to preach, to proclaim the gospel and this doctrine, heavy doctrine to our church. Personally, I learn a lot from this. Personally, I am humble and ashamed for my sin for my sin. Very, very serious about my sin. I hope you do the same for your sin. We don't stop there. We need to share this hope with people. We need to proclaim, we need to honor the one who did all of this to people as well. Until the day everything blown up, whether by God direct power or God using human to distract, to destroy human. That day will come. And that day will come so quickly that we, it's over, we cannot say, oh, wait a minute, let me, no, you cannot. <clears throat> it's called condition zero. Condition zero when we, our body, our mind, our body, our flesh, our strength, freeze, we cannot do anything. <clears throat> This military or a law enforcement term, you know, when we get to that point, it's over. <clears throat> you do not have time. The time is now. The time is now if you not yet receive Christ as Lord and Savior, repent from your sin. You do it now. If you have, you have, you're messing around with sin, with, with, with disobeying God and so on. The time is now to repent. If you've been faithful, serving God, but still tainted by sin and thought and word and action, whether willfully or unwillfully or intentionally or unintentionally, it is, it is a privilege to repent as well. So this time, beloved, let us do that. I can say I'm foremost in the moral parts and it's so worse in here. I understand my weight of sin, I understand my weight of ugliness and con condemnation in me. I understand that. Before I say to you, I understand that. Admit it. If I drag out to be executed because of my sin to my God, and I deserve that, I don't, I'm not gonna like it too much, but I, I deserve that. The thing blown up, left and right, and I'm not taken away to heaven, and I see that my second them to hell, I know I deserve that. I deserve that. However, for God's grace and mercy, give me the hope, the peace, the faith, and the love, in spite of who I am. And I give him thanks. I give him the glory and honor to the King, to my God, to my Savior, to my Lord. And this is a time that we all can catch up. Whether you've never done that before, this is the first time you really, really become a believer. Whether you've been a Christian, but you've uh, been disobeying. Whether you've been faithfully, by the grace of God, in faith. This is a time that we examine ourselves and give him the glory and honor. Remember him, his body, and his flesh, his blood sacrifice on a cross for us. So at this point, I would like to invite uh, four of the elders to come up here and 
we conclude our time together in this special moment of the communion. <clears throat> we might want to split the white brother. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> and we got two Asian. <laughs> I don't know what you think. I know what I think. Though I preach it twice, I feel the same thing twice. I praise God for that. I praise God for this moment. I thank God for who He is. I thank God for. Our church, our church, I thank God for you to be here to worship God with me. I thank God for you that I have a choice to go. But ultimately, we give him the glory. Let us bow our head in repentance and prayer. Lord God, we acknowledge, I acknowledge my sin. I understand what I mean to be the worst, the foremost the least and the foremost, ultimately, of sinners, let alone the least of all the Christian, let alone the least of all leaders. That's far from it. We understand, Lord God. We acknowledge. And I truly, for personal reason, I have to admit, I'm really sorry. And forgive me, and more than personal, advantage for my soul, Lord God. Whether you save us, me or not, I, I must acknowledge to give you the honor and glory for who you are, what you have done. You condemn me to hell, rightfully so. You choose by your sovereign will to give me mercy and grace and give me the faith and hope and love which is in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross which he explained and taught us in an apostle, Crete, the communion. Until now, we understand that because of him we free. Lord God, either way, I praise you, I thank you, I deserve nothing but to be not condemned, executed, and judged, condemned to hell is enough to receive salvation and to receive the privilege to be part of your family and serve you. That's a lot that we don't deserve. Empower us, Lord God. Give us strength, faith, hope, and love to fulfill your commission, to fulfill what you call us to do, to make you proud of our work to make you happy. Either way, you save us. Help us be useful, Lord God. Not only just barely make it to heaven, but have some contribution to save you back. To remember you in love and action and service and thought and words with one another, with others who are not Christian, especially, ultimately, to you, all of this to your glory. Otherwise, Lord God, we were left alone to ourselves and be condemned with the world. Whenever this happening, happen, we will be gone. God, the only hope and trust and, 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 and peace that we have is in you. Let this communion be the time that conclude all of that and repent, and pray, and hope, and recommitment to you, and strength, and power to go out to proclaim your death until you return. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. When we take this piece, this bread, and the elements of bread and the wine, Lord God, we ask you to help us to re not only remember you cognitively, but remember you in personal relationship and love and thanks and recommitment. Forgive us for our sin. Help us for repent sincerely. Help us to have strength to move forward from this point on. 
Help us to give you ultimately the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is a moment that we have a chance once a month, however we do this in our heart every day, to remember he died for us, to remember to repent, to remember to recommit, to save him, to proclaim his death, and to say sorry for our sin in the past, sin by nature, sin by action, they listen, and they have hope. The only hope we have is in Christ. Therefore, this is a moment to remember all the everything, especially his covenant and his blood, his body is broken for us. Take this with repentance, with examination, with judgment to our sin, and take this with joy and hope, take this with thankfulness, take, take this with giving the glory. Take this in the commitment to proclaim it. The glory be to him who did all of this. Let us take the piece of bread. Conclude with the assurance of the new covenant in his blood. The wine that pour in a cup show that he died and also at the same time sweetness of it is a celebration hope and joy let us take the cup thank you very much I would like to conclude this moment by inviting Pastor Dave to come up here and the rest of you let's join him and the conclusion, yes, Pastor Dave. Let's close in prayer.
Lord, we thank you. Um, you have been gracious to reveal to us from the, the letter from the Apostle Paul to the pastor of the Church of Ephesus, Timothy. Um, Lord, your desire for us that the, the aim of your charge for us is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And we thank you that we've even had this moment now to examine our hearts before you and to see the heart of Paul laid out on the table before us as he, though he was called as an apostle, appointed by you, Lord, that he considered him himself the least of the apostles, not even worthy to be an apostle. And even more that he was the, the least of all the saints. And even more than that, that, he saw that he was the chief of sinners. Lord, help us to be truthful in our own hearts, even as we see Paul was. And Lord, be all the more thankful, Lord, that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die to save sinners. Sinners who were the chief of sinners, sinners who were in total war and rebellion against you. And Lord, you have given us the reconciliation through the blood of Christ. Lord, our, our lives are for your glory, Lord. They should be, and, and we repent that, that it's not. We repent that we fail to give you glory when we ought to. And Lord, we ask that you would cause us to grow so that moment by moment we would give you glory. Amen. That we would praise you in, in the way that we conduct our lives, in, in Lord, the way that we see everything before us that we would see it through the grid that we have in the Bible, that we would see everything, every moment as an opportunity either to give you glory or to rob you of that glory. Lord, may we always choose to give you glory. Amen. Lord, strengthen us, O oh Lord, for the life that you have given us, short or long, whatever it is, Lord. We know that we are living on borrowed time and we know that that time is for you. So may we live it for you. May our lives be a, a sacrifice of praise to you. May what we do in the time that we have truly bring you honor. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, the one who saves from eternal wrath that, that we deserve. And Lord, we, we just live in hope that is fixed in your word, Lord. Hope that we will one day be like him practically without sin. Amen. So Lord, help us grow us, O oh Lord. Cause us to be more like our Savior. We give all glory to you, praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. May God be with us and give us strength to give him glory.